Thank you. So um, those, those of you who were at the, uh, the breakfast panel, and which was moder moderated by my CBS colleague, uh, Margaret Brennan, there you saw the, uh, the future of CBS News. I'm what the uh, military <laughs> would call a legacy system. <laughs> Built during the uh, Cold War and repurposed uh, for the 21st <laughs> century. Uh, a couple years ago, I did a, a story on uh, called the uh, Battle Above for 60 Minutes, and it was about uh, the U.S. Space Command. And at the time, the commander of Space Command was General Hyten, and he was one of the uh, the main characters in our uh, in our story. So to get ready for this panel, I went back and I reread the. Uh, the transcript online of that story, and I made the mistake of continuing on and reading some of the comments. And uh, one of the first comments I came across said, shame on you, David Martin, for putting those you interviewed in awkward positions with the questions you asked them. My time is too valuable to waste it with people who have no respect for our country's intelligence nor for the people we entrust to keep us all safe. I won't read you the, uh, the comments on my appearance and my IQ, <laughs> and, and, and I also won't read you the one that said General Hyten ran circles around me. Uh, but now I get, a, uh, I get a second shot at him. Uh, he has, uh, he's been promoted. He is now the uh, commander of uh, U.S. Strategic Command, which includes in its uh, awesome responsibilities the deterrence of war in space and the fighting of war in space if it... Uh, if it ever comes to that. Uh, Heather Wilson in the center there is the 24th Secretary of the Air Force, a job which uh, uh, requires her to become intimately in, uh, involved in space. She says she spends about a third of her uh, time on space. Uh, Carrie Bingen, uh, fourth from the end there, is uh, the Acting Undersecretary of Defense uh, for intelligence, with a portfolio which includes the National Security Agency, uh, the National Reconnaissance Office, the National Geospatial Agency, all of which uh, live and die by space. Leanne Corette is at uh, the end there. She is the president and CEO of uh, Boeing Defense uh, Space and Security, uh, which provides many of the systems that uh, the uh, other members of this panel depend on. And then here we have uh, Congressman Mike Rogers, uh, Republican from Alabama, but uh, more importantly for purposes of this panel, he is the proponent of a uh, uh, plan to create a separate uh, Space Corps, which as I understand it would be a, a uh, entirely new branch of the military service. Uh, we'd have Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Space Corps. Uh, put another way, it would take it away from uh, the Air Force, and needless to say, that is a, a controversial proposal. So I'm going to start off with uh, questions, uh, but the audience gets to submit questions too, and if you go to the RNDF app, www.rndf2017.org, uh, you can submit those questions, and um, they'll be up here and, and for the last 15 minutes we'll be uh, taking your questions. Uh, I, I want to begin uh, by uh, asking General Hyden, when you were a lieutenant colonel, uh, you wrote that uh, war in space is just a matter of time. Now that you've uh, grown all those stars on your shoulders, do you still believe that to be the case? Um. So it's good to see you again, yeah. David. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I never expected to grow stars on my shoulder. One thing when you write something as a lieutenant colonel, and you never expect to grow up and be a general, be very careful if you <laughs> write as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, but I still believe, I believe that any domain that humans move into will be subject to conflict. And when I looked at it, 20 years ago, it just seemed obvious to me, and it was also obvious to the Chinese that I was studying at the time, that conflict was going to move into space. And if conflict is going to move into space, then our job will be the same as it is in every other domain, to deter that conflict, to make sure that conflict never happens. But if it does happen, 
to figure out how to fight it and when. So it's just another war fighting problem, uh, but it's basically the same way I looked at it 20 years ago. Is the U.S. prepared to fight today in space? The U.S. is prepared to fight, but it's uh, not prepared to fight in the future. So the, the strength that we have today is based on uh, the mass and the sheer numbers of capabilities that we put up over the years. It, it dwarfs uh, any adversary that, that we face. And because of that, it makes it very difficult on an adversary to deny the capabilities of the United States. But we don't have uh, war fighting capabilities built onto those systems. And our adversaries, and you heard it talked about by General Keene and others this morning, our adversaries have been watching us ever since the first Gulf War. Um, they watched the enormous conventional power that we created that in many ways was enabled by space. And when you see that enormous capability, uh, you have to decide, am I going to just ignore that huge advantage or I'm gonna to try to do something about it? And so the Chinese and the Russians in particular for the last 20 plus years have been watching what we've been doing and developing capabilities and they have not been secret about it. They've been building weapons, testing weapons, building weapons to operate from the earth in space, jamming weapons, laser weapons, and they have not kept it secret. They're building those capabilities to challenge the United States of America, to challenge our allies, and to change the balance of power in the, in the world. We cannot allow that to happen. So we, are, we would win today, but not necessarily in the future. I'm worried about the future because I, I don't know how it happened, but somehow this country just lost the ability to go fast. And we have adversaries that are going fast. And we don't go fast anymore. We take four years to study a problem before we even do anything. Uh, we do four years of risk reduction for technologies that we built 50 years ago. Um, why do we take that much time? We take that much time because we've been able to because of the advantage we've had over adversaries. When you look at the threat and you deal with the threat, we don't have that much time anymore. We have to move right now and we have to move fast and we have to change the way we do business. So we are in a significant advantage today. But five years from now, that advantage, if we don't do something different, will be gone. And 10 years from now, we could be behind. That is unacceptable. Congressman Rogers, are we about to lose our advantage? Certainly. And it's one of the things that has really given our committee a sense of uh, urgency. When, uh, and General Hyten has enormous influence over our committee, and particularly me and the ranking member. Um, and the picture he paints to us in both classified and unclassified setting is, is scary. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians have both put a, a much larger percentage of their defense spending into this capability than, than we have. Um, and they have restructured to become uh, able to go faster, just like he's talking about. And when you look at the trajectory that they are on with capabilities, they are gonna surpass us in the immediate future, not the near future, not the distant future, the immediate future. If we don't get after this and, and self-correct, um, it was interesting, uh, about a year ago, was having a conversation with uh, General Hyten, and he was telling me and a few of my committee members that uh, those two particular adversaries were our near peers or maybe even our peers. And literally within 12 months was saying, along with Admiral Harris, they are now our peers. That is unacceptable. You know, in my 15 years on the Hask, we have always had as a guiding principle that we did not want to send our men and women into theater uh, where there was a fair fight. Well, we're about to be in that situation when it comes to that uh, war fighting domain, and that's unacceptable. So I think it's, uh, it's imperative that we have a sense of urgency, not just as a, as a Congress, but as a nation, that we get after this uh, in a serious way and make sure we regain and maintain uh, a degree of superiority uh, in that theater. How would a Space Corps solve that problem? Well, a host of ways. One is it would uh, segregate the space professionals. Let me back up. When you look at national security space, 90% of it's in the Air Force. Uh, the the uh, Navy has one weather system they, they, they handle very well. The Army does some communications, but 90% is in the Air Force. And uh, so what we have found is that it has not been able to get the attention that it needed culturally or resource-wise uh, to address these problems. 
and it has not had the ability to go fast in the acquisition process. This technology is so rapidly evolving and developing that I think it needs a unique and lean and agile uh, acquisition system. Uh, and we felt like, after looking at, at all the options available, that by segregating those space professionals in the Air Force, again, where 90% of them are, into a separate organizational construct in the Department of the Air Force, is one of the things I wanted to, to emphasize when you talk about us taking it away from the Air Force. We were gonna keep it in the department, but just segregate those space professionals, segregate the resources dedicated to national security space, and segregate an educational system for those space professionals, and develop a culture that is focused on the number one mission for those professionals who come to work every day is space dominance. Because the problem that we found as we studied this is that just like we found when, with the air uh, function in the Army uh, 70 years ago, uh, it was never going to be properly resourced or culture developed around it when it was in the Army where the number one mission was terrestrial. In the Air Force, the number one mission is culturally indoctrinated into those personnel to be superior in air dominance. That is their number one mission in life, and it should be. They're the Air Force. But the fact is, one of the other 11 missions that they have is space. It is a subordinate mission. And as we have just heard from uh, General Hyten and many others uh, who are just as smart as him on this particular issue and much smarter than us, uh, that's no longer acceptable. We have to have a cadre of space professionals who are uh, given the mission that your number one job every day when you come to work is to be superior in space and to properly resource them and educate them and value them. Uh, and we were also, and, and, and again, since money is fungible, we had to segregate that money. That we, th we think the Space Corps would have done that. Um, but, you know, we, and, and the final piece, and I, I really felt this was gonna be particularly important. We were going to, in, in our legislation that came out of the House, uh, we designated that the Secretary of the Air Force had a clean slate to, to design the Space Corps from scratch. It looked like whatever she wanted it to look like, but most importantly, the acquisition system would be unique to her and her organization. She could design it to be as lean and agile as she wanted it to be. And we took milestone decision authority away from the Secretary of Defense and gave it to the Secretary of the Air Force. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of agility. That's the ability to go fast. We felt like that was uh, the ideal uh, way to get after this in a very urgent fashion. But what we also knew going into this is that uh, human beings don't like change. It's just, it's just natural. And bureaucracies hate it. Um, that's why it took 26 years for the Air Force to evolve out of the Army. We don't have 26 years for this. But it's going to happen. It's inevitable. It's, it's got to happen. And uh, we, we think that what we did this year demonstrated that sense of urgency, presented what we think is the ideal. But we're not married to that being the only solution. But whatever we're going to do, we need to do it soon. Secretary Wilson, this would change your life dramatically. Uh, what do you think of the idea of a Space Corps? Well, first of all, I wanted to thank the Congressman for the support in the National Defense Authorization Act for the 20% increase in funding for space, which was uh, what the President requested in this year's budget. Um, the United States needs assured access to space, which means the ability to launch. Um, and I completely agree with General Hyten that we need to move quickly, uh, that we need to accelerate acquisition. One of the things the Space and Missiles Command has done just in the last month is to let a $100 million contract, a space consortium, to, uh, to innovate and prototype faster. Uh, milestone Decision Authority has been moved. Actually, uh, last year's Defense Authorization Act moved Milestone Decision Authority out of the Secretary of Defense's office down to the Air Force. I've moved it to the Service Acquisition Authority, our Assistant Secretary, and we pushed it down and said we need to go fast. We need to prototype, innovate, uh, and with our, uh, with our next steps with respect to replacing space-based infrared, with respect to indications and warning, we're gonna, we are, General Height and I are absolutely determined to stop studying things to death 
and get capability on orbit for the warfighter. But that's not all we need to do. So it's a short access. But we need to, sh you know, the United States built a glass house at a time before the invention of stones. So this shifting of space being a benign environment to a warfighting environment requires different capabilities. First of all, we need near real-time space situational awareness. So we need to know not just what's in the catalog, but we need to know what's going on and what's moving in near real time. The second thing that we need to be able to do is command and control, which means uh, it's not good enough to see what's happening on the traffic cam. You need to be able to do something about it and, and move forward with, with near real time command and control. And the third thing is we need to be able to create, create effects, both offensive and defensive. Now, both in this year's budget, but I think in, in the budgets that are, that are being worked now, you will see significant movement in all of those areas. Uh, but I absolutely agree with General Hyten and Mr. Rogers that the, the area where we need the most focus is how do we continue to reform defense-wide acquisition processes in order to move quickly, to take advantage of experimentation and prototyping, to push authority down to the lowest level, and to, and to tighten up these schedules so that we can move faster than the adversary. I think the other thing I would say is that until the 20th of January this year, it was not possible to say space and war fighting in the same sentence. That's changed. We need to deter and prevail in space as we do in every other domain of warfare in the future. But would a, a space corps help you or hurt you in all those endeavors? My view is that every mission, I cannot think of a military mission that we have that is not enabled by or dependent on space. We need to integrate space and elevate space as far as part of a joint war fighting force. And, and to me, anything that separates space from the joint fight is moving us in the wrong direction. I agree completely with Mr. Rogers that the focus has to be on how to move fast, how to innovate, and how to get capability to the war fighter. I don't think that creating more seams between a space corps and other services helps in that regard. Kerry Bingen, what, what are the uh the major threats to all those US intelligence satellites up there? Well, if I can go back a step and just reiterate uh, what some of my colleagues on the panel have said, space is absolutely vital to providing intelligence to our warfighters, to our policymakers, and our weapons developers. And so when we think about what just happened earlier this week, we witnessed another North Korea ballistic missile launch. North Korea, it's a denied area. It's tough to penetrate, whether with our airborne assets or human spies. Space provides a unique way for us to get access that we can't currently get via other means. It's the uh, intelligence imagery satellites that we take pictures of movements of the missiles and launchers. It's the missile warning satellites to detect and track those launches. And then it's the, it's the analysts on the ground who process and, and report on that data, and then the communication satellites that relay that data to the users in the field to take action. So then when I look at that and I pair it with uh, the threat, and the threat over the last 10 years in particular, 2007 when the Chinese tested that anti-satellite, that was a watershed moment for us, and they have not stood still over the last 10 years. They have rapidly moved forward in all areas uh, of anti-satellite capabilities to reduce our advantage in space, everything from kinetic energy, missiles from both the ground and the air, laser weapons, satellite jammers, cyber. We also have to remember that threats are not just to our satellites on orbit, but to the, to the communication links, to the ground stations, to the user equipment. Uh, they have taken a full, full spectrum approach to, uh, to degrading our capabilities. And I think the difference now versus where we were 10 or 15 years ago, we've been focused on, on, on Iraq and on Afghanistan, incredibly important missions, Russia, China, it's a very different game. Um, contested environment operations, uh, space is critical to that, and it's forcing us to really think hard in the intelligence community about how we effectively uh, protect those assets, how we get greater speed at scale to provide intelligence to our policymakers who aren't gonna have the luxury of time. Uh, and so we're focusing across the board, not only on resilient measures to put into our ISR architectures, but also measures on the ground that increase the speed of processing the, the deluge of data that we're getting off of our imagery satellites and our other uh, intelligent satellites, and we're focusing on scale as well. So how vulnerable today 
are all those satellites that provide all that intelligence? I think one of the challenges here is physics. Uh, satellites go in pretty predictable orbits. Um, any, uh, any potential adversary with a, a science or an engineering degree knows where those satellites are going to be. And as I highlighted, there are many avenues for them to try to pursue them. So they are inher inherently fragile. They move in predictable orbits. So there's not much that we can do to change that. However, um, there are steps that we can take to protect the mission. Uh, we are designing more resilient networks. We're leveraging our allies and partners to provide greater uh, intelligence sharing. And we're also looking at other, um, other non-space alternatives. So we're doing things across the board to try to address some of those vulnerabilities. Uh, General Hyten has, has said he would not support buying any more big satellites which make juicy targets. Uh, Leanne, how do you make smaller satellites without giving up capability? Well, I think um, first I want to say thank you for allowing um, industry to have a role on this panel. It's an extremely important topic. And um, as much as we understand this, I think there's a lot of folks who don't understand space is part of the core of what we do every day from the mundane task to um, national security. Um, and this conversation is larger than any one program or one contract or one company. This is about um, ensuring that we have the assuredness of space to gain access. Uh, Boeing is very fortunate that we um, have a strong partnership with the um, U.S. government, and both through the Air Force as well as our Missile Defense Agency. And it isn't about whether it's a large satellite or a small satellite. This is about providing the capability that's needed for the fight that is at hand and for predicting the fight in the future. So our job is to collaborate. Our job is to innovate. Our job is to provide capability faster without having to be told to go faster as well as make sure it's affordable because the rate of change in this uh, domain is moving so quickly. General Hyden, you want to? So let me just put it in uh, uh, a blunt set of observations. So uh, if you went to Boeing and you wanted to buy a, a large, oh, by the way, size is not the real issue. Speed and defensibility, that's, that's the issue. So size is kind of an interesting dynamic. But if you go to Boeing, you want to buy a commercial, uh, large commercial communication satellite, very complex communication satellite. They will enter into a fixed price agreement, and they will sell it to you and deliver it in 36 months. I was in a meeting in the Pentagon, and I'm going to keep the names out of it and the programs out of it. But I'm in the meeting in the Pentagon, and we're dis discussing uh, whether we should buy uh, a a functional equivalent of one of our current on-orbit satellites, and somebody who I respect very much, who's done this business for a long time, made the following statement. It'll be very risky if we can get that delivered by 2029. <laughs> that was this year. That's right. Think about that for a second. 2029, that's 12 years from now. Boeing will go through four generations of commercial satellites. And oh, by the way, if they can't build it in three years, they're out of business because Loral will build it in three years. That's the commercial sector. Let's say, what do we want the next missile warning satellite to be? What do we want it to be? I'll tell you what I want it to be. I want it to be a, basically a commercial bus that we can buy from anybody. I don't care. I want it to fit in the current ground system so I don't have to buy a new ground system. And then I want to invest a lot of money into a very good sensor that can do strategic missile warning for this country, and I want to put that sensor on the satellite. Boeing can do that. Lockheed can do that. Any of the nation's industry can do that. Why does our process say it takes 12 years and it'll be risky whether we can get there from here? That's ridiculous. And the great thing is General Hyten now has the support in the Pentagon that agrees with him, and we're not going to let that happen. This country can do business a different way. We do it a different way all the time. All we have to do is empower the people that can make the right decisions, put the re responsibilities and authorities in the right place, allow them to go fast, and we've done it time and time again. We can do it, we can do it once again. It sounds like you were talking about space-based infrared system. Is that what you were talking about? I was talking about space-based. In well, I was talking about space-based infrared system on the second piece because the, the secretary started walking down that piece in her remarks, and I wanted to get that. I wasn't talking about that piece in, in the 
generic conversation I was given in the Pentagon. But think about calm. Think about wideband communications in the current environment. When we built our current wideband communication satellites, it was, uh, they were designed in the 1990s. What was the commercial communication satellite industry in the 1990s? Neophyte at best. Invisible, not even really there. Somehow, we think that we still have to buy wideband communication satellites this way when we have Boeing that builds huge satellites all the time, Loral builds huge satellites, Lockheed builds huge satellites. It's just a commodity. Why don't we buy it as a commodity? It's, it's wideband communication, we buy that as a commodity and we'll spend a lot of time and money figuring out how to do strategic missile warning and those kind of pieces. It's sitting there right in front of us. It's right in front of us and it's not that hard, but we still try to make it hard. And, there are, and it's not just the acquisition piece, and, 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 and we all know this up here, there is a requirements process that is sclerotic in the Pentagon. And, and, and then there's an analysis of alternatives when on a, in a case where this is not revolutionary technology. We're not pushing the bounds of human knowledge on some of these things. We're just trying to build something that is largely well-developed and known. So just get after it and get the bureaucracy out of the way. I, I gotta jump in, Congressman, I'm sorry. But you know, whenever time we have this discussion, uh, the Congressman, the Secretary and I, it always sounds like we're, uh, criticizing the acquisition community. That's not the case. We're criticizing everybody in this room. Everybody in this room. So let's go through the five pieces that have to be fixed in order to get this done. Number one, you gotta have a budget. If you don't have a budget, you know, if you wanna know why Schriever and Rickover and all the people that came forward, so their biggest advantage is going fast, and the first of every year they had a budget and they knew what they could get done. Certain budgets, budgets that are sufficient in order to, that's a critical enabler. Then the requirements process. Why would it take three years to build a requirements process? I can sit down with a piece of paper right now, not in this room because it'd have to be classified, but I can write down the requirements for the next generation missile warning satellite, the next generation communication satellite. I already know what they are. I don't need three years of analysis to do that. Then the acquisition process. The acquisition process is broken because our program managers spend all their time in the Pentagon. They run to the Pentagon all the time for approval. They don't actually execute their programs. We have to give them the authorities. They should spend time in the factories. Number four, we have to have a test process that is efficient and tied to this, the need for speed, and that means we have to understand how to take risk in test, and that sometimes failure will be okay. And then number five, the operators have to understand how to take operational risk when we come in. All five of those things have to be fixed, and if we only address one, will not solve the problem. But if we address each one of those across the board, we can make a difference. Let me talk a little bit about acquisition authorities because this is something that has changed and it's something that the Congress gave us, pushed authority down. As of two years ago, two thirds of the major programs where we had to make decisions on major acquisition programs, two thirds of those programs were managed within the offices of the Secretary of Defense. That is now completely reversed so that two-thirds of those programs are now at the service level, and we've requested delegation of the rest of them. Of those that are at the service level, I am not the acquisition authority for any of them. I've given them to our assistant secretary, and we've pushed everything else down. So program managers no longer have to come to the secretary and, and up into OSD to get approval to move on, which, which takes months out of this process, and we're gonna continue to move, move forward in that direction. But I think there are some other things that we need to think about just kind of stepping up and back a little bit. They have to do with strategic things. Uh, how do we deter and prevail? We've never really had to talk about that in space before. How do we hold at risk things that other countries value? How do we create doubt in the mind of an adversary that if they were to take out our space capabilities, the consequences for them would be unacceptable. That's the nature of deterrence. And then how do we defend, restore, and operate through in the space domain in the same way that we do in every other domain of conflict? Those are the kinds of strategic decisions that we're trying to set up in the national defense strategy and which the Air Force and the other services are now focused on developing those capabilities, demonstrating those capabilities, and sending a message to our adversary that the last thing they want to do is mess with the United States of America. Congressman. 
Yeah, I just want to reemphasize that if, if anybody really believes that you're going to see dramatic change in the way national security space meets its challenges uh, without dramatic organizational change, you're fooling yourself. <clears throat> the first study that came out on this uh, that really sent alarm bells off was in 2001, the Rumsfeld Commission. And by the way, that was the first group that suggested a Space Corps as one of four options to, to address our concerns. Since then, there have been three GAO studies and also the Allard Commission, all of whom have said the same thing. So the, sec the, the and I'm, this is no reflection on Secretary Wilson, who is a personal friend of mine. I served with her in the Congress for eight years. She just got here. She didn't cause this problem. But the, the Defense Department let this problem languish. The Air Force was not able to self-correct. They are not going to be able to self-correct as long as 60 offices can say no and cause a 12-year acquisition process, uh, but yet nobody owns it and nobody can say yes. That has to be changed. We are going to have to rip this out by the roots and put up a new system that not only has good acquisition, but builds a culture around space dominance that values it. Uh, one of the things I talked about early in this process was to, talk, to, to emphasize the cultural concern is uh, this past year, there were 37 bird colonels nominated for Brigadier General in the Air Force. Guess how many of them were space professionals? One. Zero until I made that point and then it brought one up. But even at one, that's unacceptable. If you're a bright young engineer or a professional who wants a career in space and in the Air Force, but you'd like to grow some stars like this gentleman did, you're not gonna choose space because you're not gonna be valued. We need to make sure these bright young people who would like to have a career in space know they'll be valued, educated, and nurtured and can actually grow some stars. Uh, that's the way we're gonna have superiority in space. I have, to, I have to take issue with that because I think we have exceptional airmen who are wearing the badges that General Hyten is wearing. And, and I've met a lot of them. They're providing the first global utility to the world. They put that blue dot on your phone. That GPS is operated by a squadron of 40 airmen in Trever Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And they provide it free to a billion people every day. It is an exciting time to be in space in the United States military. And while one of 37 last year became brigadier generals, actually in the last two cycles, a higher percentage of space officers became general officers than the average in the Air Force. So there is a tremendous opportunity. Um, but it's not just those who come up within space. I think when, when, uh, when General Goldfein walks into, the, into a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or when he was, when he was uh, the commander of the Air War, in Central Command, a guy named General Mattis turned to him and said, you're my space control authority. They don't know what all the sparkly stuff means on their left shoulders. They just know that they look at that blue uniform and they know that you're supposed to be in charge of space and air and airlift and the nuclear deterrent. We are the Air Force. We're responsible for this and we own it. And I'm really proud of our airmen who are part of this, part of this, part of this space world. So just on the question of advancement in the, uh, in the Air Force, mm -hmm. if you're in space, General Hyten here is a self-described space nerd. Mm -hmm. Geek. And yeah. Geek, yeah. <laughs> I insulted you. Um, he did and all right. He did all right. He's the exception rather than the rule. He was dedicated to it and decided to pursue that path, path despite those challenges. What I'm saying is most young professionals are going to see fewer opportunities to get to where he got. Uh, but there are people like him, General Greaves, that are just wonderful examples. I want to see more of them. I personally think the uh, Space Corps that we suggested was going to uh, create more opportunities. Let me give you another example that we illustrated. Uh, the professional military education that they required uh, uh, in the Air Force has 450 hours of education. Do you know how many hours of that was dedicated to national security space? Two. You don't value national security space when you don't put more of, a, of, of that in your educational curriculum for your officers. 
So I just want you to understand it's a cultural thing that I don't think will ever be uh, properly addressed until you have this segregation that we're talking about. That's my view. That is the view of the House Armed Services Committee. And we're going to continue promoting this because we are not willing to allow China and Russia to surpass our capabilities in, in space because it's, we have become too reliant on it, not just in our daily lives commercially, domestically, but militarily, it is absolutely intertwined in everything we do to fight and win wars. Uh, <clears throat> Secretary Wilson, you raised the issue of how do you hold another country's space assets at uh, risk. She really didn't uh, answer your own question. Um, and I saw a recent uh, speech that you gave when you asked another really basic question. What is the policy of the United States if another country destroys one of our satellites? And you didn't provide the answer to that. Is, is there an answer to that question? The United States heretofore has not had a declaratory policy with respect to space. Um, but I think it's probably time as a country that we start to talk about this. Um, that if one of our satellites, particularly our satellites that provide indication and warning of a missile launch or that provide command and control for our national command authority, that if another country interferes with those satellites, that we would consider that to be a hostile act and we will respond not necessarily in the same domain. We respond across domains. I mean, think about it, when, uh, when, uh, the, when Cornwallis uh, was defeated at Yorktown, it wasn't because we defeated him by bombardment on the land. It's because he was cut off by the French from resupply at sea. We respond across domains as a nation. But by demonstrating that capability and be, by being open about it in a time of peace, we, we reduce the possibility of miscalculation and crisis so that our adversaries know that we will respond if they seek to disrupt our ability to command and control our forces or seek to disrupt our ability to see if someone attacks us with a ballistic missile. And by declaratory policy up front, I think we reduce the likelihood that someone will, will, will actually destroy those satellites in time of war. So, so we've never had a declaratory policy before, but like I said, we lived in a glass house. We didn't need one. And I think it's now time for the United States to consider whether we need that kind of declaratory policy. It sounds like the, the time has, has well passed since we need a declaratory policy if, if these other countries already have an, an ability to uh, to take out our satellites. Well, as I said, until the 20th of January this year, we couldn't even say space and war fighting in the same sentence. In fact, when I was going up for confirmation, I had those words in the same sentence. There was a holdover appointee in one of the other departments who actually sought to strike it out. And I said, you'll have to get somebody of higher rank in order for me to do that. General Hyten, uh, uh, airmen probably don't care that much about declaratory policy. What they care about is rules of engagement. What do I do if such and such happens? Are there rules of engagement for operating in space? No. And it's, uh, it's the only domain, even, even cyber we have rules of engagement when we, when we operate in cyber. Uh, when a soldier or an airman or a, a sailor goes to operate a, a space system, uh, in critical support of operations around the world that go into that mission without any rules of engagement. The only place that we do that. That's because we don't have any international norms of behavior to start from. And we've never taken the time, because it hasn't been a contested environment, to sit down and, and walk through that. Uh, it is a significant issue. That, and that's one of the reasons why I support the development of international norms. And we're going to figure out our own rules of engagement. And we're doing it ourselves in strategic command. That's also not the right answer in the overall scheme of things. Uh, the command that operates and, and defends and, and uses space should not be the one that defines our own rules of engagement. But without that kind of uh, guidance from above, we have to figure out how to do that. Yesterday was a, was a significant day in the operationalization of, of space. Yesterday at Vandenberg, just north of here, uh, we stood down the the Joint Functional Component Command for Space, a functional component. And we stood up 
a Joint Force Base Component Commander. It went from a three-star to a four-star. General Jay Raymond is now my component commander. Sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? But it's not. It is wholly different. Because if you go into any combatant command around the world, and I've worked in CENTCOM, I've worked in PACOM, and you walk into that command, what you find is an air component, a land component, and a maritime component. You walk into STRATCOM, you used to find 18 components, functional components, nuclear task force, structures. About this time next year, by this time next year for sure, when you walk in, you'll have an air component, a space component, a land component, a maritime component, a war fighting structure that everybody will understand when we come into it. And we put a four star in charge of it, the most knowledgeable person in space. Because as much as I love space, uh, it is not my top priority at strategic command. My top priority is the nuclear enterprise. And it will always be, it should always be, the commander of STRATCOM's number one priority. Which means I need a four star general, the smartest guy that I can find and put him in charge. And the language in the NDAA that uh, is on the president's desk right now will help establish General J. Raymond as that, as that person, the commander of Air Force Space Command. But today, for the last 12 hours, he's also my space component commander. One of the things that I, I give him a lot of credit for, the vice president stood up again, the National Space Council. I think that one of the things that, that's helping to bring greater focus on space, but not just national security space, uh, commercial space, where we're seeing plummeting cost of launch and plummeting size of payloads, which makes, is making space a common domain for human endeavor, but also the groups that are starting to look at these norms of behavior. And we think about, all right, who's in charge in space? Well, on the national security side, it's, it, for us, it's, it's General Heighton. But that's not really the question they're asking. Um, when you fly from here to Tokyo, you fly through an ungoverned area. But there, there are norms of behavior for how that, for how that happens over the Pacific Ocean. So the development of norms of behavior uh, in space um, is one of the things that has to be done government to government and with the private sector. Um, we've got them issues on launch. We've got norms of behavior on, with respect to, to creating debris. Uh, the United States, since the 1950s, the United States Air Force has been keeping the catalog of ob objects in space. And we actually are now in the ironic situation where we tell the Chinese, you know, they, they put about 3,000 pieces of debris on orbit when they did the launch in 2007 and destroyed one of their old weather satellites. They had 3,000 pieces of debris in orbit. We're now in the ironic situation where the United States Air Force is telling the Chinese when their debris might interfere with one of their satellites. So that's one of the services that we provide. But uh, norms of behavior with respect to debris on orbit and minimizing debris on orbit. So I think there are a lot of nation to nation kinds of things that I think the Vice President's National Space Council will help to facilitate. For an outsider, it, it's next to impossible to follow and understand the organization of all those commands in space, the joint functional commands. And that in uh, 2015, there was uh, something called the Joint Interagency Combined Operations Center, which had the worst uh, acronym in military history, JICSPOC. Yeah. Um, and then that got somebody with a sense of branding, and it may well have been you, <laughs> uh, changed that Thanks to that. Uh, National Space <laughs> Defense Center. So what is the National Space Defense Center? So words are important. So when we labeled a place, the Joint Interagency Combined Space Operations Center, which is basically every word associated with space in one acronym. <laughs> uh, and we said, okay, that's the place. It doesn't matter whether it was you, David, or whether it was our allies or, or, or the secretary, you could never explain what it was. So I decided in conjunction with the intelligence community uh, that maybe we ought to just call it what it is. And that's what it is, National Space Defense Center. The place where we go, all national security space, intelligence community, uh, the Department of Defense, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and we put everybody in and we figure out how to fight that fight. And yes, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. There are two Marines that 
came to work in the National Space Defense Center. And you wonder what the heck two Marines are doing. I tell you, General Dunford came to visit. As a Marine, he puts his eye on those, those two young Marines, and he makes a beeline right for them, ignoring everybody else, just right for the two Marines. <laughs> two young captains. And he's, he just has a great time. How are you doing, Marines? How's it going? How's life going here? The Marines did a great job telling the story. And after five minutes, he realizes, well, maybe I should go learn what this place is about. And so he, he moved on, leaving those two Marines feeling good about themselves. And I walked up to him and I said, okay, Marines, you tell me the truth. How are you guys doing? And I said, well, sir, there's 70 people in the center. 68 of them are smarter than we are. <laughs> and I said, when it comes to space, that's probably true. But when it comes to war fighting, as a captain in the Marine Corps, you probably know better than anybody else. And if you just treat whatever problem that comes to you as a war fighting problem, you will be the most valuable people in this room. Because why do you maneuver? You maneuver to avoid contact. You maneuver to gain positions of advantage. That's what you teach a Marine from the very beginning. How do you defend yourselves? They know exactly how to do that. Just treat it as a war fighting problem. And it is a war fighting problem that's focused on space defense. That's why it's called the National Space Defense Center Joint and Interagency. So it sounds like a battle lab. It, it, it's a war, if you're gonna have a war fighting domain, you have to have a place to fight it. But everybody should understand there is no such thing as war in space. Doesn't exist. There's just war. You don't fight a place. You have conflict with an adversary. The adversary uses all domains to try to gain advantages over us. That's why STRATCOM is now focused on those domains, because we want to provide integrated responses to a problem. So when I have a problem and it comes to me and if it happens to be in space, I will look to my air component, my space component, my missile defense element, and my maritime component for the right response to provide up to the forward. And we'll work with the geographic combatant commander, whether it's PACOM or UCOM, et cetera, to figure out the, the response. It's not that hard. It's a straightforward military problem and war is a horrible thing. I never want to fight a war that goes into space, but if we do, we better figure out how to do it without ruining the environment. And that's a difficult position to be in. I would say that the, the National Space Defense Center, you know, I, there are two things that I talked about that we needed to do now that our glass house, that the, the invention of stones for, to protect our glass house. Real time, near real time space situational awareness, so the, the picture of what's going on in space. And the second is the ability to make change, so command and control in space. The National Space Defense Center is intended to bring those together with an open architecture, and we've told all of our contractors and the people who build things for us that there's gonna be no more exquisite one-off science experiment controls of specific things up in space. If it doesn't integrate and it doesn't share, we're not gonna buy it, because it has to be command and control has to be integrated. So the National Space Defense Center is moving from initially an experiment, which is what it was started as about 18 months ago, um, to an operating warfighting center, uh, where Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, as well as the National Reconnaissance Office and other space uh, uh, elements with, or space interests to be able to have an op that operating picture and command and control of what's going on in space to create effects, to, to protect our high value assets, and to hold at risk Others. Say that again, operational warfighting center is, is. It's exactly what it is. It is operational? It's a, it looks like an ops floor of uh, any other ops center that you would see anywhere around the world, whether it's uh, maritime, land, air, or integrated. And so the follow on question, David, is what happened to the Joint Space Operations Center at Vandenberg? Uh, so let's look back at the words National Space Defense Center. It's national. Our, inter our allies will not be at the National Space Defense Center because we're bringing in all of the most sensitive classified information from the intelligence community in that, that place and, and we won't share that. But the Jace block at Vandenberg is going to change and I've uh, directed the new space component that I want that to be a coalition space operations center uh, by the end of next year where all our coalition partners and the commercial uh, partners that we have can all come together and understand and we will integrate those two centers together to provide that, uh, that seamless command and control that we need across the Space Force. So involving your allies, involving the commercial sector, involving the intelligence community, that's the unity of effort that, we're, that we have built in the construct that we have right now. So uh, Kerry Bingham, what, what difference has it made to bring 
the intelligence satellites into the uh, other military satellites. I talked earlier about speed and scale. And for us, for the intelligence community to effectively support all of the warfighter operations that General Hyten has to do, we have to be faster. And I think that's one of the common themes you're hearing today. Um, one of the items I wanted to pull the thread on a little bit is Secretary Wilson mentioned all of the debris we have in orbit today. I went back and looked, 2007, about 100,000 objects, debris, uh, satellites, other things on orbit. 10 years later today, 180,000 objects up there, so an 80% increase. We don't have all the airmen and the analysts in the United States government to sit and watch 180,000 objects move and figure out what's squawking, what's maneuvering to potentially threaten one of our satellites. We also, we as an intelligence community, also need to bring additional tools to identify, to characterize, and really to predict uh, what that debris is doing. Maybe it's not debris, it's something else. So there are things that, that we are working on, and, and the buzzword right now, it's uh, artificial intelligence machine learning. But this is an area that is, it, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. We have to be investing in this. We have to be moving out. And oh, by the way, China, China has, has made AIML one of their mega projects. Um, by 2030, they want to be invested 100, $150 billion in this arena. Uh, US, US uh, private sector investments, almost $40 billion in this arena. We, FY17, put $30 million into this. So there is some significant uh, uh, an opportunity here for Department of Defense and for the intelligence community to do more in this arena. One of my uh, favorite facts about the U.S. military is that the, uh, the surveillance wing at Langley Air Force Base had the highest cavity rate in the United States Air Force from drinking all the Red Bull they needed to keep awake looking at the, uh, the monitors of all those drone feeds. And I think I remember hearing uh, General Selva say that if all the uh, imaging satellites that are planned to go on orbit in the next day, decade get up there, that the U.S. would need something like a million photo analysts to, uh, to handle all that data. If we do it in the same way, and that's actually one of the areas where we think there's tremendous opportunity for machine learning and for analytical tools and algorithms to, to help us reduce the number of eyeballs staring at screens and use artificial intelligence to tip to where we want to look at. Um, but it's also a, you know, a really good example of um, I, you know, what are the challenges that the Air Force has faced over the last decade? I, I think there's no doubt that the, that, the, that the most devastating impact to the Air Force across all of our missions in the last decade hasn't been from our adversaries. It's been, it's been from sequester, and we still haven't recovered from the sequester in 2013. So the most important thing that can be done for space and all the rest of our national security missions is to lift the Budget Control Act as it's currently structured. So, so the, the financial issues have been there, um, but I also think there are some structural issues, some structural changes, and one is, when you think about this, the entire Air Force and the military is focused on winning the fight in the Middle East. And at the same time, the United States Air Force developed the GPS-2 satellite and now the GPS-3 satellite, so advancing GPS. They came up with the, the, the new space-based infrared satellites that are now being, being put on orbit, um, developed the X-37 space plane, which is pretty revolutionary. I'd still rather be us than them, but we've still, you know, now, now where we are, we've got to put the throttles forward, move even faster, become even more innovative, more machine learning to get ahead and keep, get ahead and stay ahead of the adversary. I heard last night at, at dinner that um, the Air Force was looking at using AI to navigate the acquisition process. <laughs> it has um, a lot more applicability than intelligence. <laughs> one of the things that also people don't, some people don't remember, or, or there's always time to, you know, moment to to uh, remind ourselves, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is primarily responsible for imagery intelligence, is a joint venture between the United States Air Force and the CIA. So half of the employees at the NRO are Air Force. So, so the Air Force has been involved in all aspects of this space business for, for a long time, and they've, they're pretty good at it. We need to change it to a warfighting domain. Um, but uh, in terms of take a technical capability, um, there are things there to be proud of. Leanne, yeah, let me, uh, GPS came up, and you guys make uh, 
GPS. I went and looked at a, uh, a GPS satellite, not to buy it, but just to, to look at Did it. Did you want to buy one? <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of payment plans. It's good. Okay. <laughs> But it sure did look like a juicy target to me. How do you, how do you defend a GPS satellite? Well, I'm not going to get into the specific technologies or tactics in this form, clearly. I think the point being is, as technology continues to evolve, what is the requirement, what is the capability that is trying to be um, get, um, derived how do we do that in the most effective way? How do we have it in a capacity or a capability that can maneuver and can avoid um, and can have situational awareness, bring in the artificial intelligence, and do it in a way that it doesn't take 12 years? I think the most exciting point of the conversation we've been having since January is we are now having this conversation out loud and in public where we are all focused on such an important domain that Historically, we've looked at as inspirational, but we know it's now part of the core fiber for how we live our lives. As industry, we have an obligation to bring forward our best people, our best talents, and do it in a way that is economical and meets the needs of this nation. I'm about to go to uh, uh, questions from the audience, but uh, Congressman Rogers, did you have something you wanted yeah, to Yeah, I was just listening to uh, General Hyten uh, talk about those two Marines that he was having that conversation with and just the fundamentals that he was re-emphasizing and then him. It, re it reminded me of a conversation that he had with my subcommittee that helped us understand why China and Russia have uh, stepped up their activity. And I thought I, I would share it with you because it was uh, illuminating. You know. <clears throat> When, when, when he was telling us initially that how much more China had put as a percentage of their defense spending into national security, R&D, and acquisition, as well as Russia, uh, he emphasized, uh, you know, just like I talked earlier, our, our, our domestic societies become heavily dependent on space, and, and, and the military has. Well, they realized that, but they also realized that Tactically, they can't defeat us in a head-on-head in a -head battle. Uh, they can't. But if they can take our eyes out and our ears out, they might actually have a fair fight on their hands. As I told you earlier, we don't ever want to let these folks have a fair fight. But also, they can't compete with us, not just in a head-on-head -head tactical battle. They can't compete with us financially. So if they wanted to, to start buying a lot of weapons systems or or, or other capabilities, they, they just aren't as wealthy as, as we are as a nation. This is an area where they sense a vulnerability that we are completely dependent upon, and they actually can put the resources against it to make us vulnerable and susceptible. It really helped us understand why we need a sense of urgency about this and why we as a nation need to have a greater appreciation about this concern that we've been talking about here today, because it goes across all aspects of our national security. Uh, you know, the North Korean threat that we've got right now that, that has had a lot of people wrapped in attention. Uh, most folks aren't thinking about the fact that our first way of detecting a launch by North Korea so that we can turn our radars to start tracking it and start aiming our interceptors to be able to get it in time is a satellite up there waiting for that heat signature. We cannot let that satellite be dazzled for 10 or 15 minutes. It would be too late. That's how volatile the situation is. So it's a very important topic for this, this body to be talking about today. And, and uh, this gentleman is doing some great work in that area. And uh, I appreciate everything he's done for this committee as well as our nation. OK, so I'm going to start with some questions from the audience. I'm going to ask this first one, and then I'm going to run for cover. Um, <clears throat> is the lack of a rapid acquisition program a military or a congressional problem? Both. The, uh, the thing that I also want to emphasize about that, this is not unique to the Air Force. This is across all the services, this bureaucratic, lethargic um, acquisition process. What I was and am hopeful about with this Space Corps is when it's implemented, and it will be implemented, if not in the next couple of years, in three or four years, five years, we will hopefully have this pilot program where we can take a blank slate, 
create an agile, non-bureaucratic acquisition system and prove it works so we can then replicate it in the other services. And the fact is, as we've talked about in the earlier panel, they, they talked about in the earlier panel, and, and we've talked about some here today, Congress is as guilty as it can be for, not, for being negligent in properly resourcing uh, our military and allowing this, uh, this uh, sequester to continue. It was one of the stupidest things that's happened in my 15 years in Congress, and we ought to own it and fix it. I, I think it's both. I think it's both as well. I'm testifying on the Senate side next week on acquisition, and I'm going to be bringing forward five additional suggestions on changes to the, to the acquisition rules to allow us to free things up even more and go faster. But it, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not going to be, there's not going to be a single fix. It's not going to be just legislative or just administrative. I also think that there is a, there's this irony in the Air Force that there, we have operational airmen who will take tremendous risks on our behalf. We have an administrative, administrative side of the, the Air Force and the other services that have been punished for taking risk and hence are risk averse. And so we have to not only free up, but act as though we want them to move fast, fail fast, be celebrated for it, and move on to the next experiment and prototype. That's a different culture, and, and, uh, and it's going to take sustained effort over time and preparation and support of our program managers um, when they try something that doesn't work and they move on. And uh, oftentimes, both you know, senior leaders in the Defense Department but also in the Congress will say, you know, how are you going to make sure that that never happens again? And the answer is, we're not. You know, we're, we are going to allow people um, to fail. That's why we call them experiments. Uh, and uh, and you know, when, when somebody gets hauled up to the hill, which will probably be me, to explain, <laughs> explain why something didn't work and who's accountable, the answer is, I'm accountable. And I don't mind failing fast, as long as we can move faster than the adversary. So I don't understand <clears throat> why Space Corps won't become prisoner of the same acquisition processes that the, the rest of the military is, is held hostage to. Well, it, nothing to say that it wouldn't ultimately, but I think in the initial phase there would be so much attention to keeping it lean and agile that it would initially be rapid. But uh, don't think bureaucratic creep can't get anywhere over time. I just don't think it would happen initially. Mm -hmm. Um, we, uh, we covered this uh, a little earlier, but it's, it's a rich topic, so we'll go back. Um, the question is uh, for General Hyten, if the U.S. needs to adapt faster in space, why is the Air Force planning a next generation missile warning satellite constellation that will not be operational until 2029? And I, I would just add to that question the, uh, the request for information for the follow-on uh, Sibber's uh, network uh, described the uh, request as compelling and urgent. Compelling and urgent, 12 years. <laughs> Anybody see anything wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm a combatant commander. Uh, I'm the nation's uh, warfighter when it comes to nuke space, cyber missile defense. Um, my, my lever in this process is a requirement from the warfighter. And my requirement from the warfighter is not the same thing we've been buying, delivered in 2029. My requirement is an agile, uh, good enough capability that should be delivered significantly in advance of that 2029 date. And I'd have talked to enough people in the industry that I know that that is possible. It is not an unrealistic piece. We also have to be careful not to let the requirements run wild. If you the way I described the strategic missile warning satellite a while ago, it's a simple satellite. It's not hard. But I was around for the summer study of 1995 when we defined SIBRS, the space-based infrared system, to begin with. And if you want to know everything that's wrong with SIBRS, go back to 1995, when we said, you know, if we just put another sensor on it, we could put a stair and a scanner. Oh my gosh, you know what? We could do BA, battle space awareness, and technical intelligence. We could do missile defense. We could, we could do theater missile warning, we could do strategic missile warning. We can do it all on one satellite. That would be awesome. Seven billion dollars later, we're trying to chase that set of requirements. 
So we have to hold the requirements under control in order to go fast. But we can. And all I can tell you as the combatant commander is that I'm going to be adamant about the requirements. And I'm going to watch the requirements very closely. But it's up to the Air Force to, to go build it. Uh, and I think we have great leadership uh, in the acquisition business in the Air Force right now. Uh, I think we have a great partnership with the Missile Defense Agency, who, by the way, also needs an infrared satellite on orbit to do what they need to do uh, for mid-course characterization. And if you put those two pieces together, gosh, we could buy a lot of capabilities for the amount of money we're putting in the budget. Because guess what? There's not enough money in the budget to keep buying billion-dollar satellites and putting them up and then trying to defend them. Can't get there from here. But if you can make them $200 million satellites, $100 million satellites, all of a sudden, all kinds of opportunities open up. We have to go down that pathway. We have to. And, and I can't control the acquisition process, and I won't. But I can control the requirements that come out of the combatant command, and I will do that. You know, one of the... Uh one of the unsung, or one of the unsung heroes of, of the Air Force was a guy named John Boyd, who, uh, who was uh, uh, really the father of both the A-10 and the F-16 in, in, in some ways. And um, he was an iconoclast. He was always clashing with the kind of official structural Air Force. And, and, um, and I'm, I'm so tempted sometimes to kind of take one of the lessons from John Boyd, which is no request for proposal will be longer than 30 pages and every proposal back to the Air Force can be no longer than 50, and it better be dense with real specific proposal stuff. So there are things that we can do that, um, that, uh, that, that take us back to our roots as bicycle mechanics uh, who, uh, who get things done and don't let the paperwork slow us down. So just out of curiosity, why is the, uh, the need for a new missile warning satellite so urgent and compelling? So uh, the secretary described it uh, pretty well. They, I was just watching it the other night. Every missile that comes off the planet is seen first by one of our overhead missile warning capabilities. Uh, the first Sibir satellite launched quite a while ago now. Uh, we have six in the acquisition change to buy, and then we have to decide what we're going to buy after that. Oh, by the way, those six satellites are not easy to defend, and they're that is a significant problem in itself. So we have to make sure we continue to provide that capability to the warfighter every day. It's one of the most important missions STRATCOM has, is missile warning for the, for the nation and the world. But we have to make sure that it's there. But in order to make sure that it's there, it has to survive on orbit. It can't be a target that it's easy for an adversary to get after. So we have to put both of those things together. And the way you put both of those things together is that you know, if you only put one sensor on the satellite and then it's strategic, guess what? With the sensor technology today, I also believe that you put it up on orbit, what you see is going to blow you away. It'll be amazing. Well, that's good. What are you going to do all the, all the other extra room? As far as I'm concerned, I just want to carry gas and a bigger motor. Because if I can move quick, man, all of a sudden everything changes. You know, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm looking at a, lo a lot of pilot wings in the audience. Uh, you know, if, if you're trying to get away of an adversary, uh, A-10 is nice, F-22 is better. You know, I don't want to be flying B-52s around the heavens when the guy that can shoot me is sitting right there. So we, it's just a simple warfighting problem, and we have to look at it that way. Leanne, what happens at the contractor level when requirements run wild? Stable requirements are the key to any successful program, and as the Secretary highlighted, um, whether it's on the government side, on industry side, if we don't deliver the capability, if we provide, um, if we have cost growth that results in additional um, funding from the customer uh, that hampers their ability to do other things, I'm accountable from a Boeing perspective. Uh, having stable requirements is our single best friend. I always say good fences make good neighbors. Uh, we understand how we're going to operate, but it's not just having handed a set of requirements and operating to that. It's having collaboration. It's having insight. It's making certain that the language that we're using we all understand and that we have the right uh, measurements in place, both technically and 
financially so that we can provide a win-win because we're in this together. Industry is only here because of our customer. There is no benefit to us uh, to not be partnered. There is no benefit to us to not invest. Um, but we are going to be with our customers, um, and I can speak to that from a Boeing perspective, through the long haul, through good and bad, and we're going to own it when we mess up. But I'd like to do as much as we can up front to minimize the opportunity to mess up. So when I was a lieutenant and a captain, I was an engineer in the acquisition business. It's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about it now. But I always remember the, the person I wanted to grow up to be was the colonel who was the program director. I didn't want to grow up and be the general, for gosh sakes. That's just horrible. <laughs> but the colonel was, why did I want to be the colonel? Because they had the authority and responsibility to get things done. And they were going to be the ones that delivered GPS for the world and DSP for the world and DMSP for the world. They were, they were the ones that changed warfare. They're the ones that delivered all the capabilities. And I remember a couple of big failures. And I remember the firings that came with those failures because we held them accountable. And I also remember there was 10 people lined up to take those jobs because they wanted, put me in coach, I can get it done. Now we're having trouble keeping colonels in the acquisition business because we don't give them the authority and responsibility. That's, that's changing now with the secretary's leadership. That's changing now with the leadership in OSD. But we have a culture that, that is gonna, it's gonna be difficult. But man, when the lieutenants and the captains start wanting to be the colonels again, that'll be the day we get it right. You know, we, I, I mentioned that we've been given a lot more authorities that were delegated down to the service from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. In fact, they gave us eight more yesterday. So they've, they've delegated more down, uh, Secretary Lord did. Um, but of our, our second level programs, we call them acquisition category two, there are 42 of them. All 42 are now with the Assistant Secretary. Of the third level, which is average $70 million kind of programs, there are, there are 373 of those. Um, 274 of those are now at the full colonel level or, or below. So we have pushed authority back down to the colonels. We need to make sure those colonels have the, the, the skills, abilities, education, training to be able to do those jobs. I met recently with our program managers and they are all, you know, busting buttons because they're going to make this work and we're going to get out of their way and we're going to keep the bureaucracy out of their way for cost, schedule, performance, and to get the capability of the warfighter, which is what they get up every morning to do, is to, is to support the guys and gals on the line who are taking the fight to the enemy. And that's a tremendously satisfying piece of work. When we were uh, doing the story on Space Command two and a half years ago, you told me about a program which was designed to find out what's going on in geosynchronous orbit. And we've been talking around about the importance of geosynchronous orbit with the missile warning satellites. And so you, you told me that you'd put up these two geosynchronous space situa situation awareness satellites, but they weren't operational when we were talking. They've been operational now for two years. What have they found? We have four now. Four. Uh, uh, well, I won't tell you what they found. <laughs> 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 but I can tell you that our adversaries uh, know that they're there, watch them very closely, and understand that if there's anything that goes on in that critical real estate and space, we can watch it, we can take a picture of it, and we, figure, we can figure out something to do about it. That's deterrence mm -hmm. uh, when it comes right down to it. You know, deterrence is, uh, you know, it's, it, the, the fundamentals of deterrence haven't changed, and it's my command's number one priority. It's the ability to impose cost on an adversary, which is what you think when you get to the nuclear business. It's, it's the ability to deny benefit to an adversary and making sure you're credible and it's communicated well. Space actually focuses more on the de deny benefit side to deter, to deter than it does on the imposed cost side. And one of the ways you do that is having exquisite situational awareness, which those satellites provide in the geosynchronous orbit which is a, a very powerful deterrent to our adversary because there's nothing they can put 22,300 miles above the earth now that we won't know about. You said that with four seconds left. So <laughs> we, have, we have come to Good the uh, end of our panel. I want to thank everybody up here on the stage for 
answering the questions, and I want to thank everybody in the audience for uh, being patient listeners. Thank you.